From the Whiskey Tangent Studios in Marlton, New Jersey, this is Whiskey Tangent News. Hey everybody, this is Ed from the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, here with another episode of Whiskey News, Woo! and joining me as always is Scott. Hey everybody. And let me tell you what we're going to do today. All right. Lots of stories. Uh, nine stories are going to be focused on three main categories this month. Three stories will be based on what we call industry news, tell you what's going on there in the world of whiskey. Three stories will be on the financial side of this thing we love to drink, <laughs> and three are stories of entertainment. We will tell you about 16 new whiskeys coming out this month that you can buy, mm -hmm. and then we'll discuss what's coming up in November on the Whiskey Tangent Podcast with yours truly and Scott. <laughs> that's right. So it is October 2023, and here's all the news that's fit to drink. In industry news from Whiskey Advocate, Uncle Nearest Distillery buys legendary cognac. Interesting. When Fawn Reaver debuted Uncle Nearest in 2017, she became one of the very few women and a woman of color at that with a whiskey brand that she founded, owns, and directs. In 2020, Weaver announced even loftier ambitions, the creation of an entirely new spirits group. And she's just taken the first step by purchasing Domaine saint Martin, a 17th century cognac producer situated on an expansive 100-acre estate near the Charente River and encompassing 50 acres of Grand Champagne Vineyards. The property also has a distillery, barrel cellars, and a cooperage. Said Weaver of the purchase, the Uncle Nearest brand thrives on its profound story of love, honor, respect, and heritage. Our mission in cognac echoes this essence. Although we likely won't see cognac from the new owner until next year, Weaver is drumming up excitement with a short movie that's set to debut at several film festivals in the coming months, which will feature a detailed history of cognac and its spread from France to every corner of the globe. That's amazing. So are they going to be aging some of their stuff in cognac barrels? Possibly. Possibly. They, I think they are going to put out a cognac. This is the first step in her grand idea to have a spirits group and has a worldwide reach. Sort of the opposite of what's been happening with like, you know, Campari buying Wilderness Trail right. and all these other bigger right. conglomerates. Right. right. International companies buying whiskey companies. Right. But she's doing the opposite. Yes. Yeah, she's turning the tables on them. Hmm, interesting. Good for her. Yeah, it's really cool. The next story we have is Breaking Bourbon. Whiskey House builds house for whiskey. Okay. <laughs> Whiskey House of Kentucky, a new venture from the team behind Bardstown Bourbon Company, has announced the construction of a state-of-the-art distillery, which will begin operations next year on July 1st. Located on a 176-acre campus in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, Whiskey House will be the most sophisticated, technologically advanced producer of custom whiskey in the United States, with 14 33,000-gallon closed-top fermenters, 16 41,500 barrel capacity rickhouses, a 50,000-square-foot warehouse, a spent grain processing plant, a bottling facility, a rail system, and access to one of the highest yielding hydrostratigraphic limestone aquifers in the region, all of which will eventually yield 224,000 barrels or 14 million proof gallons of whiskey per year. Founded in 2022 by David Mandel, John Hargrove, and Daniel Lind, who left Bardstown Bourbon Company in 2019, mm. Whiskey House is the first distillery designed from the ground up to focus solely on large-scale, flexible contract whiskey production. Their aim is to create a fully integrated operational and information technology infrastructure that captures and analyzes data across the entire manufacturing process, utilizing artificial intelligence to continually improve quality and efficiency, increase her Production yields, expand sustainability initiatives, and provide critical real-time information to customers about their liquid, says Mandel. As the bourbon market continues to grow, we see the need for additional distilling capacity and more customer-focused solutions. We will provide the highest quality production, guaranteed capacity, and exceptional customer service for our brand partners. Whiskey House will reshape the contract whiskey market in the United States. Wow, so... Watch out, MGP. I was going to say, MGP, there's someone coming from you, or coming for you. This is very aggressive. Isn't it? But it makes sense that the guys from Bardstown, because Bardstown is huge, yeah. and it would take someone who's been involved in something huge to envision something that gigantic. Yeah, impressive. So what do you think? It's going to take them like two years to be relevant. Yeah, so it's I mean, and that's basic. I mean, really, it's going to take them 10 years, so MGP is not going to have to worry for probably a decade. Well, maybe. Because some of the MGP stuff is 15 years old, you know? Yeah. So, so four years from now. Yeah, four years. Four years, they can definitely be 
a huge impact. I think another thing this might do is uh, lower prices. Well, it could very easily help reduce the power of the secondary market. Good. Um, if some people who get stuff from MGP now expand and get some from uh, Whiskey House. How's that name not taken? I don't know. Whiskey House. <laughs> I mean, we had to go to Whiskey Tangent to get a podcast name. <laughs> Are you telling me we could have been the Whiskey House podcast? I'm like, been. Jesus, such a better name than Whiskey Tangent. Oh my God, we could have sued them. Right, that would be suing them right now, and they pay us off in like, I don't know, probably a brown and a half of rye whiskey, to be yeah. perfectly honest. Like the clear stuff. Yeah. All right, so the third story we have in industry news is from Wine Enthusiast. Study finds sexual harassment rampant in the whiskey industry. <laughs> you can't see it, but Scott keeps n- moving closer and closer to me. <laughs> While he's talking. That's false. All right. That's false. <laughs> Every episode I have the pepper spray on my lap because he gets all <laughs> drunk and randy. Who's I- Randy? Is that what they mean, though? Is you mean in the industry between like makers, or is it like whiskey makes people do bad things? Uh, between the people in the industry against women, oh, especially. Well, this is just another thing we need to talk about in January. Exactly. So uh, Jackie Zykan, a former bartender, educator, and master taster for Old Forester, has seen her fair share of discrimination during her 15 years in the industry. She's had lost job opportunities, been talked over while leading seminars, and had her educational credentials questioned, and even experienced outright abuse. Says Zykan, I've been grabbed at events i've been followed to my car i've been roofied someone even grabbed me by the throat and tried to shove me in the back of a van as co-founder and master blender at hidden barn whiskey now as i can't believe she's among the few women of whiskey empowered enough to speak openly about these often shocking events but as a new study from our whiskey foundation has shown too many women in the industry are still quietly dealing with it conducted in july of just this year the first of its kind study collected anonymous responses from more than 600 women across 30 countries and a variety of whiskey industry roles among the findings 83 percent said that they had encountered customers who preferred to speak to a male colleague instead 70 percent reported experiencing inappropriate sexual remarks and 44 percent of women said that they've been inappropriately touched while doing their job mm. uh, taylor from banash she mentioned to us was that was all fair right yeah that was all fair so we won't mention who she was mentioning it about but but she herself who has picked barrels and is a pretty known person when it comes to spirits was talked down to and condescended to when someone said uh, that she wouldn't know anything about the whiskey when she's the one that picked the barrel right so yeah so that's just a local person and i will tell you also that i had an opportunity to speak with melissa etheridge one time and she said that she experienced a lot more prejudice being a female rocker than she ever did being a lesbian right so i thought that was interesting that she would say that i think this january we're going to have a lot of eye-opening stories that are going to show how hard it is to make it and why there's not as many women in whiskey so we'll see women have been voting for 100 years and we still don't have a woman president and a lot of people think that's still a long way off Mm -hmm. maybe maybe not right um so in financial news from fred minnick tennessee's whiskey trail generates billions in tourism According to a recent study by Tourism Economics, distilleries are one of the most significant drivers of tourism and economic growth in Tennessee, bringing in 8 million non-local visits and $3.45 billion in economic impact just in 2022 alone. Launched six years ago, the Tennessee Whiskey Trail is composed of more than 30 distilleries spanning the state from Memphis to Bristol, including world-renowned brands like Jack Daniels, Old Dominic, Old Smoky, and more. Said Mark Easel, Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development, visitors from around the world make the pilgrimage each year to explore the time-honored craft of Tennessee whiskey, which creates revenue and jobs for all Tennesseans. We're proud that the trail has become an exponential driver of tourism and economic impact throughout the state, and we hope to continue to grow and bring people back for more. That's so true. Scott and I, we want to go to Kentucky really bad. We just haven't been able to make it happen probably after the new year, I think now at this point. Yeah, and we should hit the Tennessee Trail too. Right. So the point is we wouldn't be going to Kentucky if it wasn't for the bourbon. And the same thing as Tennessee. I mean, I've been to Nashville for vacation, so maybe Mm. I can't say that. But if I go back to Tennessee for the Tennessee Trail, once again, it's for the bourbon. Right. And so we talked a little bit about how distilleries were kind of starting to slack on their tax paying. Right, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and we beat them up pretty good. It was I think it was last news, right? Yeah, we beat them up pretty good last month. Yeah, because you know people have come to rely on them, and they do get some concessions, but they want more and more. But if I was them, what about the eight million visitors we bring for your <laughs> hotels and your restaurants? Right? How about adding a sales tax and a you know like a hotel tax or something like that, mm-hmm. and take advantage of the business we're bringing into you? You know, tax them all a dollar. That's eight million dollars right there. Tax mm-hmm. them ten dollars. It's eighty million dollars, right? Mm-hmm. It's the Disney argument in Florida. Like, yeah, Disney gets way too many concessions on one hand, but how many people do they bring into Florida? Sure. 
Sure, sure. And I'm sure that the distilleries are like, you know, you're not really being fair to us completely because 20 years ago, you didn't have 8 million visitors. There wasn't a bourbon trail really that was established and promoted. Distilleries didn't have visitor centers. So times have changed, which is, I wonder if that's why they're pushing back against the barrel tax. Oh, sure. Because they have so much power now. The fact that they bring in $3.45 billion to the economy. Right. They have a power because they have money to buy lobbyists and exactly and all that. <laughs> yeah. I believe there should be a yin and a yang. I just don't know if they need to not pay any local tax at all anymore. That seems to be excessive. Right. But I wanted some distilleries to still like us after last month. So I'm trying to, you know. <laughs> no, I'm sure yeah. they still don't even know about us. <laughs> <laughs> So a uh, second story in financial news is from Forbes.com. Uh, U.S. whiskey could soon suffer massive European tariffs. Just last Friday, a trade summit began between the United States and the European Union to iron out an agreement to slash lingering tariffs on goods that ship across the Atlantic Ocean. However, if no progress is made by the end of this month, the EU will begin taxing American whiskey at a rate of 50% starting on January 1st, 2024. For American distillers, it's a disheartening flashback to when the EU imposed a 25% tariff in June of 2018 to retaliate against tariffs imposed on imported steel and aluminum by then-President Donald Trump, which caused U.S. whiskey export revenue to plunge 20%. The EU did eventually lift the tariff last June, but the new looming threat would charge a tax twice as steep. The prospect of which has distilleries, frankly, terrified. Indeed, many craft producers are considering pulling back product from the European marketplace entirely, because if the tariffs are reinstituted to the degree proposed, it would create an overwhelming financial burden to remain competitive, <laughs> stifling growth of the U.S. whiskey sales in its largest export market. For now, there remains a narrow window to get the deal done, but come October 31st, the window shuts for good, as does Europe's access to competitively priced American whiskey. I say ship it now. <laughs> yeah, ship it all now. Ship it now. <laughs> Got to ship it all out. <laughs> Shipping on out to the top, yeah. <laughs> to a deluxe European city. In the sky. <laughs> and we're shipping on out. Wow, the crickets are rushing to their posts. Yeah, we have a lot to record tonight, so they better yeah. get ready. <laughs> They're working in teams today, from what I understand. <laughs> All right. Um, the third story in financial news is from the Whiskey Wash. The world's oldest scotch found in a castle is set to be auctioned. Ed, you sent me this story. Yeah, it's too good to be true. It would be fake if it wasn't real. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So in late 2022, Bertie Troughton, resident trustee at the 750-year-old Blair Castle in Perthshire, Scotland, found 40 bottles of whiskey on a shelf in a room behind a previously hidden cellar door. According to documents found with the bottles, the whiskey was distilled in 1833, bottled in 1841, and then re bottled in 1932. The whiskey was initially sampled by the family and a local whiskey expert before an auctioneer was contacted. Since then, research in the archives of Blair Castle, alongside professional authentication of the whiskey via carbon dating, support its early 19th century origin. In addition, other records indicate that Queen Victoria visited Blair Castle for three weeks in 1844, just a few years after the whiskey was bottled, prompting speculation that she had actually tasted some. Said Angus McRoud, a specialist in old and rare whiskey, the fact that this has been carefully rebottled bottled and preserved at natural strength, maintaining the freshness and power of the spirit for nearly two centuries is frankly astonishing. It is very much a distillate-driven malt whiskey with minimal wood influence. I find it to be a pleasurable and hugely charismatic whiskey, quite typical of older style Highland malts. This is a remarkable artifact of Scottish distilling that is unlikely to ever be equaled in terms of provenance and preservation. That's amazing. How many bottles? 40. 40. Wow. Yeah. So the only part that I find interesting and I don't understand exactly is rebottling. Yeah. I don't know why it was rebottled, but uh, I mean, I, it could be that the corks were starting to disintegrate and they felt like possibly they had to. I mean, I, I wonder what that does to pop the bottle, pour it into another bottle, reseal it. Mm hmm. You are adding well, some oxygen at that point. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But Jesus, it was originally bottled in 32. would be one of the oldest whiskeys we've ever talked yeah. about. I don't believe in inflated prices, but if any bottle's worth $25,000, it'd be one of these. But I'm sure it goes <laughs> for a lot more than that. Yeah. So it goes on auction next month. So we'll, we'll follow up and see what it went for. Jeez. They could all be $100,000 each. I mean, maybe they're a million dollars each. I don't even know. I know. I know. Here's the thing. If you're worth a billion dollars, having a million dollar bottle of this would be just so cool to have in your collection and then for when other billionaires come over who don't have them like oh you don't have the <laughs> you don't have the 1841 right whatever uh, they call it uh, 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 Blair Castle Blair Castle scotch yeah. oh yeah I have two of them yeah oh you only have two of them I have six I have the barrel too by the way <laughs> 
Barra, I bought the castle. Oh, my <laughs> God. It was so good. <laughs> outdoing each other. Oh. That's what we would do. I have if the, we were rich, we yeah. would just outdo each other. I have the bottle with Queen Victoria's lip prints on it. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. So, <laughs> here we go. In entertainment news. Yay. Uh, USA Today, the cast of Always Sunny in Philadelphia releases a new whiskey. I didn't know they had an old one. Uh, yeah, so stars Rob McElhenney, Charlie Day, and Glenn Howerton have teamed up to create something their Always Sunny characters would be happy to serve at Patty's Pub, a new Irish-American whiskey called Four Walls, which is a blend of Irish grain whiskey, Irish malt whiskey, and American rye, made in tribute to the four walls that the gang calls home a bar. Initially sold as a limited edition release to raise money for the Pennsylvania bartending community as it coped with the pandemic, its success prompted the guys to look for ways to make a new version of the whiskey for wider sale. Said Day, after our high-end releases, it was important for us to make a whiskey price so that all of our fans could try it and that bartenders would want to use in everyday drinks. Now available nationwide, the 80 Proof Whiskey retails for $34.99. So they brought Irish whiskey over and yeah. then and then I, blended with American rye. I guess so. Yeah. I'm really looking for someone to make a really true Irish whiskey in America. We have a lot of single malts coming out that have notes of scotch, but I haven't really tasted that kind of Irish tang, if you know what I mean, that makes an Irish whiskey for me. Mm-hmm. You know, very prevalent on Green Spot or Jameson or yeah. Powers. That thing that lets you know whenever you sip it that this is not a scotch, it's not an American rye, it's an Irish whiskey. I mean, maybe they can't produce that in America. So sure. So I think maybe you're. I think you're looking for is probably a single malt that's been triple distilled and maybe aged not very long because that would be sort of an Irish style. I think in yeah. a pot still. Yeah. Um. The next one, the nerd is coming out of me for this one. Brian sent this in from the Whiskey Raiders and GeekDad.com. New Spirits Company rolls the dice on Dungeons and Dragons whiskey. Ooh. <laughs> Find Familiar Spirits, a joint project from actor Matthew Lillard, a screenwriter Justin Ware, and Blue Run founder Tim Sparapani have released 5,000 bottles of the first in a series of four D&D themed whiskeys under the brand name Quest's End. The first expression called Paladin is described as possessing... <laughs> That was my character. Oh, were you working Paladin? That was my first character ever. Then I became a druid later on. Oh, druid. But a Paladin was my first character. Yeah. Is described as possessing, quote, notes of vanilla and fruit in keeping with the noble aims of a Paladin with an undercurrent of spice to reflect their fighting spirit. The whiskey itself is sourced from undisclosed Kentucky and Tennessee distilleries and crafted by master blender Ale Ochoa, a whiskey scientist at Texas-based Firestone and Robertson Distilling Company. Paladin also comes with a booklet containing the first chapter of a fantasy saga entitled titled Dawns of the Unbound Gods, written and illustrated by longtime D&D author Kate Welch and artist Tyler Jacobson, who also helped design the bottle. Said Lillard, we were looking for another avenue in which to spend our time to build something. And with the whiskey success that Tim had, we sort of put those things together and came up with this idea, a direct-to-consumer, high-end whiskey experience that's really about telling a story as much as it's about delivering incredible whiskey. If you order something like a $200 bottle of vodka or tequila or whiskey, they'll wrap it in bubble wrap, stick it in a brown bottle, and ship it off to you. So how do we change that? How do we add value? What are the things that would spark to us as game players? And that's how we came up with Quest's End. The other three whiskeys in the series, Rogue, Warlock, and Dragon, guess which one Scott's getting? Dragon. Will be released throughout 2024, but you can buy Paladin now at questandwhiskey.com for $150. Well, for only 5,000 total bottles, that's not crazy. I won't be doing that, but... No, but look at... look at Oh, the bo- nice bottle. Yeah, it's a cool bottle, isn't it? You know, when uh, Brian first sent me the story, I'm like, oh, come on, guys. $150 for sourced whiskey and stuff. But then when I read an interview and then how they crafted it, and it reminded me a lot of the Star Trek Spirits guys and how yeah. they approached it. So I was like, well, okay, I think we could give this a chance if they were willing to send us a sample. Yeah, sure. I'll, I didn't say we wouldn't try it for them. Sure. I'm starting to realize that a $150 bottle isn't what it used to be. Yeah. Like, that yeah. used to be a lot of money. But now, unfortunately, it's kind of what a $100 bottle used to be. Yeah. Like, that's just where we are. This week, I bought the new Remus 7 mm-hmm. for $104. Yeah. And that's right where it should be. It's a beautiful crafted whiskey. We haven't tried it yet, but we shall. Yep. 
I buy a lot more 80, 90, 100, 125 dollar bottles than I did when we started the podcast four years ago. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, but um, it's very much like you said, like one hundred and fifty dollars is no longer that much money to spend for sort of a rare whiskey. Right. I mean, that's what happens. And we've avoided it for a long time, as long as possible. Yeah. I think we're now in it. Yeah, because to be competitive, to do what we do, you know, we've drank the Kentucky Owls. We've drank all the barrel stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, Pappy Van Winkles and right, right. Stags. And, and George Stags. And, right. Now, we actually have avoided gray label barrel because mm-hmm. that's 250 Right. But eventually, we're going to have to drink them. You know, we either wait for Doug to get one and go over his house. <laughs> well, <laughs> spoiler alert, uh, Brian actually has a dove. Uh, is it dovetail or seagrass? That's the gold label. Something like that. And he was going to bring oh. it over. So oh, let's see. Yeah. So, so February, that'll oh. be out. Hello, Brian. Hello, Brian. Hello, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> And the last story that we have before we get to the new whiskeys. Wait to hear this. New York Daily News. Motley Crue drummer Tommy Lee puts a new spin on Jack and Coke. During a chat with comedian Bill Maher on the latest episode of his Club Random podcast, the 61-year-old rock icon Tommy Lee offered up a startling revelation about his behavior during Motley Crue's heyday. Lee said that he and his bandmates had no control over their alcohol intake during the height of their fame in the 1980s, saying, it's easy to fall in love with the way it makes you feel, the way it makes you relax, and then all of a sudden you're like, fuck, I'm drinking two gallons of vodka a day? You're just trying to kill yourself now. Lee went on to say that when he and bandmate Nikki Six ran out of cocaine, they would shoot up Jack Daniels with a syringe. It was quick, faster, louder, and harder. He said, we would do this shit all the time. We run out of coke. Well, let's shoot up some Jack. Can you fucking believe that? You could kill yourself doing that. You would just, think. Just injecting alcohol into your veins? Jesus. If you, if you want to read a sad book, read Nikki Six's autobiography. Oh, yeah. I've heard the stories in it, but like I the, haven't like read it. Like the Heroin yet. Chronicles, basically. Yeah. Basically means he lives in a mansion, he does heroin, he gets paranoid, and then he spends the night in his walk-in closet in his massive bedroom of his mansion with a rifle or a shotgun or something, scared of the boogeymen coming to get him. Mm-hmm. Like, Ozzy's was a great autobiography, which spoke about all the carnage. But Eric Clapton, who's basically like, I was drunken on speed and I was no one. I was drunken on speed. I'm famous. I'm drunken on speed. And now I'm an icon. You know, you know Johnny Cash just speed. I mean, I don't know what drugs I would have done. Lord knows I drink a lot of whiskey now and I'm not famous. Right. But I'm locally famous for the amount of whiskey I can drink. True. And um, honestly, probably should drink a little less whiskey. <laughs> yes, we should. But what gets me is when my doctor's like, your liver is a little elevated, you probably drink a little less. I'm thinking, how in the fuck did Ozzy, with I his know. bottle of Hennessy and Coke every day, yeah. you know, let me from Motorhead's bottle of Jack every day for 25 years, yeah. right? You listen to how Tommy Lee says he's drinking two gallons of vodka a day. How are they doing that, right? Still alive. The Rolling Stones, I saw them <laughs> just last night. They had an album release party online for their first new material in 18 years. I know. Isn't he 80? He's 80. Jesus. And I think Keith Richards like got to be like 79, right? <laughs> yeah. He's right there. Yeah. And Scott, I'm telling you right now, if I die before Keith Richards, I want you to shoot him for oh me. My God. <laughs> I want you to take him out. I'm making a blood oath with you right now. Not the not the whiskey, a right. real blood oath. This if, is a real blood right, oath. If he has the audacity to outlive me, okay. I want you to take him out. All right. All right. I will. I'll wait for the attorneys from the Rolling Stones to contact me and <laughs> cease and desist. <laughs> cease and desist threatening the life of Keith Richards. All right. All right. So what we do next on the news here is the all the new whiskeys that you can buy this month. We have 16 of them. I don't think it'll take that long because some of them are sort of bundled together yeah. in releases. And uh, Well, before we do that, can we talk about a local one just I picked up today? Sure. So over at Benash, I was there today. A very good friend of mine, Jason, and his wife, Michelle. Michelle's been battling cancer for a long time, and she's been so strong and, and done such a great job fighting, but it's slowly and surely getting the better of her, and it's really terrible for the family what they've gone through. But Benash and the family put out a special bottle of Maker's Mart private selection that they chose and 30% of all money raised goes right to fight metastatic breast cancer. Right. Okay. So anybody in the area go buy Benash. They should still have some left. And if not, they have the ability for you to make just donations for breast cancer and buy any other whiskey you want there since you're there because it's plenty of whiskey. Right, yeah. I just saw Jason today and I've tasted this one. I haven't opened this particular bottle I just bought today, but I've tasted it while I was there. It's delicious. It's a really good bottle coming in at about 109.9 proof. So just wanted to put that out there. If you're in the area, be sure to grab yourself a bottle 
of Maker Smart fighting breast cancer at Panache. All right. Very good. Yeah. Um, the first whiskey that we had that you can get this month, we actually poured some in a glass now, and we, we're going to try it yeah. as we do all the rest of the whiskeys. It's the Larceny Barrel Proof C923. Right. I picked this one up at West Hampton. They uh, had it on the shelf for a very good price. I couldn't resist it. It was like $64, mm. which is pretty much cost for what this is in the area. Don't think you find it below 60 in New Jersey, no, that's for sure. No, the MSRP is 60 so right. finding a rarer right. thing like this. Ooh, the nose is like buttery. Yes, Yes. Isn't it? So the, just to get stats on this, it's 126.4 proof, age 68 years. Uh, mash bill, of course, is the larceny mash bill, the 68% corn, 20% wheat, and 12% malted barley. Oh, how smooth is that for... <laughs> I mean, it's got a little bit of a flutter, but my gosh, it goes down like a 105, 108. Caramel and spice. Yeah. Like so much caramel on this. This is definitely not as sweet as some of the others, but not sour. It's very balanced with the spice, mm -hmm. like baking spices and uh, everything that you can oh imagine. Oh my gosh. It's I, like a pie. Definitely got clove on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, cardamom. Mm -hmm. It's got the real strong spices, not just cinnamon it, nope. and nutmeg. This has Correct. really complex baking spices on here. A little bit like if you put a little bit too much spice in your pumpkin pie mm -hmm. and drizzle Sizzled it with caramel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what yeah. this tastes like. Yeah. This is great. Oh, this is a delicious one. Yep. So that's the Larceny Barrel Proof. Um, yeah, just a really mini quick taste. We've done Larceny Barrel Proof to death. Yeah. It also won the Whiskey Madness one year, too. Correct. That two years last ago. year. Yeah. Two years ago. Was it two years ago? Yeah, because um, Old Lime. Old Lime won this past year. Yeah. So oh, well, I see what you're saying. Two years ago. Right. So I'm saying. <laughs> are we saying the same thing differently? <laughs> yes. Well, how are you explaining? What? A year and a half ago, and you're saying two years ago. Well, it's two. It's two winters ago. Two winters. It's yes, not winter. It's two winters ago. We've now we've confused everybody. <laughs> it's the 2022. There we go. Well, whiskey let's, madness. Right now, this is how I should have said that. In fact, Scott, it won the uh, whiskey madness in 2022. Indeed, it did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See how short that would have been <laughs> if I had just said it like that. But no, I had to be like two years ago. You're like, no, not really two. Scott's going chronological by calendar. I'm like, right, because two years ago to me is 2021, and that's not when it happened. Right. <laughs> This is the stuff we do off air. Right. This normally it gets cleaned up in the edit room. And once again, I put the ed in edit. That's right. Okay. So the second whiskey that I have this month is Bird Gang Bourbon. So the Philadelphia Eagles. Bye. Have become partners in Bird Gang Spirits, a homegrown affiliation between the team and the Philadelphia Distiller Bottled, spelled capital B O T L D, emblazoned with the Latin phrase Volare, Aquile, Volare, or Fly Eagles Fly. Fly, Eagles, fly. The new whiskey, along with the vodka, is available for a limited time at Bottle Storefront on 18th Street near Rittenhouse Square and online for delivery within Pennsylvania only. It's 82 proof, no age statement, no mash bill, rich and robust notes of corn, rye, and a hint of malted barley, which is pretty generic, but the MSRP is only $38. Do we know anyone who tried this? Mm, I think Jeff bought a bottle. Yeah, but did he try? We, don't, we didn't I don't get know taste. If oh, it. we should have got taste of some. I bet it tastes very pedestrian. It probably it does. Yeah, I can't imagine it being. It spectacular. sounds like they rushed it out just to have. Yeah, and once again, you know, if you're tailgating outside of the link and it's 48 degrees out, you don't really care what it tastes like. Yeah, all that warms up your belly. That's right, and it's uh, 82 proof, so uh, you can session it. All right, it's to help you get into the stadium for the tailgate. You know, <laughs> that's right. Uh, the next one we have is Buffalo Trace antique collection oh my god is it time for the museum to open it, yes it is the, the whiskey museum <laughs> the ultimate unicorn whiskey collection is back just to go through it again it's eagle rare 17 it's 101 proof george t stag 15 year it's 135 proof the william larue weller 12 year 133.6 proof the sazerac rye 18 year 90 proof and the thomas h handy six year 124.9 proof the msrp for each of them is 125 but again good luck oh my god i would buy all of them right now for that price <laughs> yeah and i'm actually shocked that i've tried three of the six mm. eagle rare 17 mm -hmm. the thomas h handy mm -hmm. and the george c stag right so I feel blessed that I even got to know half of them. I know. Uh, the next one we have is Catoctin Creek Hot Honey Rye. I tried it. Have you? I bumped into a rep at a bar and she had it in her bag. Oh, yeah. It's a flavored whiskey. So it was, it's actually finished in honey barrels. Yeah. So first released as a barrel of select expression in May 2022, this pot still rye infused with chili peppers and three types of honey is now available nationwide. No age statements, but it's 80 proof. So it's still a whiskey. And the rep said that the first time they made it, I forget why it was doing it, but the barrels were leaking so much honey. They had to put trays underneath to catch the honey. Oh, getting, my gosh. It got heated up and the, it was forcing the honey out of the barrel. Oh, interesting. Three 
through the wood. And so they were catching it, and the honey was evidently spectacular. Oh, I bet. And um, yeah, so I literally tried that, and it was really good. Mm-hmm. So I'm surprised I didn't know Scott was going to mention that one. No. But, but that was probably two months ago that happened. Oh. And they told me that this batch was coming out. Oh, cool. It's 100% rye, honey cake, ripe fruits, candied nuts, and sherry notes with baked apple, blueberries, cherry syrup, a hint of ash, peppermint, and a dusty farm like quality MSRP $50. I would say it would be worth it as a change up. I try it. It's good. Because their ryes can be a little funky. Like they're very rye grain ryes. Yeah, they're very, f- they're very field to glass. Yeah. I said field to glass, not feel my ass, Scott. Get off me, you freak. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm getting randy. <laughs> uh, the next one we have is Chicken Cock. It has a new release called Red Stave. This is uh, a bourbon finished in J. Wilkes Petite Syrah Barrels, a type of red wine from Paso Robles, <laughs> California. No age statement, 102.4 proof, 70% corn, 21% rye, 9% malted barley, dark chocolate, caramel, vanilla, pear, apple, cherry, red currant, cranberry, black pepper, nutmeg, and clove. The MSRP is 200 I one time, I finished in the back of Jen Smith Mini Cooper. What are you talking about? Did you said you said it was finished or something? Oh, uh, petite Syrah barrels. Right. Was she petite? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, the next one is the King of Kentucky. So this is one that I've been hearing about uh, recently. This is mm-hmm. the sixth annual release of Brown Foreman's update of a brand that dates back to 1881. This year's version is their oldest Rayet, a 16-year made up of 51 barrels from a single production date in 2007. It's 125.8 proof, 79% corn, 11% rye, 10% malted barley, graham cracker, vanilla, charred oak, port, cognac, coconut, dark chocolate, mocha, black tea, and leather. The MSRP is 300. So Brown Foreman still has their own releases. Yeah. Because they own Jack Daniels. Yes. So I mean... And Old Forester. Right. I thought they were just a holding company for all these other places and then... So they actually released Brown Foreman has its own whiskey still. Yeah. Not their own whiskey still. <laughs> well, they, well, yes, they lots would. Lots of stills. They would anyway, right. <laughs> the next one we have Old Elk, your favorite name. Hey, Old name. Elk, good whiskey. Uh, cigar, Bad name. Uh, cigar Cut Island Blend. This is their 2023 cigar blend. A blend of their high malt bourbon, rye, and wheat whiskeys finished in port, sauterne, sherry, and rum barrels. It's 111.7 proof. It's aged at least six years uh, originally and then up to two years Wow! in the various finishes. That's a lot. Yeah. Honey, spice, and pear on the nose. Stone fruit, pear, vanilla, and honey on the palate. And layered and tropical notes on the finish. Yeah. Honey, it, spice is my favorite one. <laughs> MRSRP is uh, 130. Man, it's always just a couple dollars more than you want. Right, I know. know. Six to eight years. And it is finished. And I get that. But it's 130, which is twice the price of the last thing we're drinking right now, mm. which is 68 years. It's delicious. Like, I I'm mean, getting so much brown sugar now. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, it's almost like a brown sugar syrup. I've said this before. Woo. You know, I'm going to add a, a drop of water into it just because we haven't, but I bet you at 120, whatever, 124. I think. Oh, my God. It, and your note before it, which I heard but didn't remark upon, the smoothness of it is amazing oh. for that proof. All right. So the next one we have. Pinhook Vertical 8 is out. Shut up. Yeah, so as you know, we've done shorts on 5, 6, and 7, and the last one just a few months ago, we speculated that the proof would go down and the price would go up, so we were right. <laughs> the proof went down only 0.4, though. Wow. So it's 114.6 proof. The 7-year was 115, and the MSRP is now 90. The 7-year was 78. Orange Curacao, Oloroso Sherry, Clove, Brown Sugar, Dark Cherry, Plum, and Cinnamon. I'm not happy with a 90. It's too much. I know. It's too much. I have to tell you, I saw it last week for 72. The 7? Yeah, or the 8? The 7, the seven yeah. And so, to me, 80 is the correct jump. 80, and then maybe 88, and then 95. I know. We were just talking. And that's oh, what, I mean, we're going to have to buy it. They got us. They knew what they were doing. <laughs> They knew that we would keep drinking it. They know that I have to know what the eight tastes like. Yeah, we already done three. We have to do four. And then I'll know what the nine tastes like. Yeah. Yeah. All right. uh, The next trio of whiskeys, Savage and Cook, has put out some We haven't talked about them in a long time. I know. So they put out a rye, a bourbon, and an American whiskey. Uh, The rye is finished in Grenache wine barrels. It's 100 proof. Three years aged, 51% rye, 45% corn, 4% malted barley. The bourbon is finished in Cabernet Sauvignon wine barrels, uh, 100 proof. Three years aged, again, uh, 75% corn, 21% rye, 4% malted barley. And the American whiskey finished in Zinfandel barrels, 113 proof, four years aged, 66% corn, 30% rye, 4% malted barley, which is a bourbon mash bill, but the whiskey was originally aged in used bourbon barrels, not new charred oak, so it can't be called a bourbon. The MSRP for all three, $50. 
Yeah, Savage and Cook, one thing I remember about them is they don't really give a damn about following rules. Nope. They do their own thing up there. They got weird labels, yep. weird bottles, everything's finished in wine. I always picture them being on an island in the middle of like Hudson River or something. They're in San Francisco, but they are on an island. <laughs> I think it's Mayor Island. They're on the West Coast? I want yeah. to think they're in New York. I don't know. They're on the West they Coast. They got a New York attitude. Yeah. They do not strike me as a West Coast company at all, but except for the fact that they're kind of like have a wine history. Yeah. Um, the last one we have, then we get to see what we're up to next month. Yellowstone Toasted. This is the inaugural bottling of their special finishes collection, a new permanent label in the brand's lineup, consisting of the regular bourbon finished with five varieties of staves named for the aromas and the flavors they impart. Double toasted American oak, high toast, vanilla, rickhouse, and spice rack. Wait, it's, so they have five different toasted? Five different staves in this one. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, whiskey. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I thought they came out with five different ones. No, no. 100 proof, four years aged, 75% corn, 13% rye, 12% malted barley, toasted caramel, vanilla, cinnamon, walnut, toffee, black tea, white pepper, cocoa, tobacco, and oak. MSRP. 50 so very reasonable yes look at all these reasonable whiskeys yeah and because i just saw the um, penelope toasted in the store today mm. 63 which wasn't terrible but yeah. i feel like toasted is now 60 so for that to be 50 hands off yeah 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 wait hats off how about ha- that hats off not hands off keep your hands on <laughs> again <laughs> All right, so what's coming up on the podcast in November? There are four Fridays, uh, November 3rd. We're doing episode 69, Amberano Finished Spirits with the Whiskey Chicks, who should be here in about a half an hour. Yeah, we're recording it tonight. This is a warm-up for us. Right. Uh, On the 10th, we will be doing a short, uh, the Remus Repeal Reserve Series 7, which we will also be doing right now, maybe before they get here. Or maybe we'll have them do it with us. We'll see what happens. I believe they might need a warm-up. Maybe. Then on the 17th, we'll either have no podcast or maybe a surprise bonus short. And then on the 24th, we'll be right back here doing the November news. Right. So if you heard a bottle that got your attention and got you excited, go out and find it. They're all out. Mm. The Larceny Bowerproof is out. You know, they come out, what, Scott, three times a year? Yes. And so this is the C923. It's 126. Wow, I thought it was 124. Mm. You can really taste an extra two points. <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> yeah. So go out and get a bottle of something nice, something right. Check us out in November for all the uh, episodes coming up. We're doing hard work. Tell your friends about us. WhiskeyTangent at gmail.com. <laughs> oh, dot com. Hold oh, on. hello. <laughs> WhiskeyTangent <laughs> at gmail.com. Tell us what you're thinking. Let us know if we miss any new releases you want us to know about. Mm. So for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, I'm Ed. I'm Scott. Cheers, everybody. Later. Later.